everybody, my name is Tom Tran and we are the Flippers Think Tank. So basically self-explanatory, we want to share ideas, uh, share everything we do. So don't be afraid to ask any questions. Um, they're all good questions, we want you to learn, that's the main objective. And let's go next slide real quick. So Ken Chung is the founder right here. Thank you uh, to Ken, we have a meetup group. He's brave enough to stop. <laughs> Yeah. So without Ken, it wouldn't have been my first deal. I know, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rick, what's up? So you owe him half of your uh, paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, take I'll take a little juice. <laughs> Sorry, they didn't give you your 12 fives. <laughs> uh, oh, well, you'll pay interest on it. It's all okay. you. So that's me, Tom Tran. You want to introduce yourself to Ken? Okay, sure. My name is Ken. I've been working with Tom for a while now, investing with him. Um, my background is insurance, been doing that for 13 years, looking to get out of it, go into real estate, much more fun, meet nice people, hang out with Tom, have fun after the meetups. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And then we have Tam Lee right here. This is the founder of Charmant's Properties. It really is a mom. A lot of people thought it wasn't a mom, but that's our mom right there. Yes, yeah, way. Too. Yeah. And today, I'm so excited that we have a full room of people, and we we are excited to hear um, our speaker, Sheila Wong, and she also a mom. She a flipper. Yeah. So, that's great. Way to go. I don't know if everyone came to see me or came to see Sheila. Because <laughs> when it's just me, there's five of us only. <laughs> Alright, so next slide. So, why Charlotte Mom's Property? A lot of people ask, why am I involved with a mom company? So, back in 2012, I actually uh, just started real estate. And I wanted to learn how to flip. But uh, back then, there wasn't really any meetup groups or anything like that. So, I looked around, I found these two mom flippers. And they're willing to share everything they knew about flipping. They even allowed me to join them on projects. I had no money. I don't know why they want me involved. I had no money, I had no repair experience, but they just wanted me to get started. So that's why we wanted to start this company, to kind of give back. So how can we give back and teach more and more, not just moms, but everyone in general, um, how to flip real estate. So that's the reason behind it. Um, another reason is because we truly believe that when a mom and a dad, I guess, um, work together, it's, it makes a happier family, everyone's financially uh, stable, so we want to encourage more family businesses. So that's the reason behind that. So next slide. So our mission is to pretty much show you our exact steps of everything we do. Uh, we're not afraid to share every single thing we do. Uh, the main thing, we want you to really get started and get started investing, make money, and then do bigger projects. So let's go next slide real quick. So this is a very informal group. Uh, just think of us as your friend talking on the phone. So don't be afraid to ask questions. We're going to have an open uh, conversation back and forth, back and forth tonight. So let's go next slide. And we do need your support. So if you can go on meetup.com, that's probably where you found our meetup. Please uh, rate us, like us, rate us 10 stars, rate us one star, as long as you rate us. And we do have a Facebook. Thanks to Ken, we have a Facebook page. <laughs> so please like, if anyone can jump on your phone real quick and look, uh, look for Stronger Moms Properties. Can you do me a favor and do that real quick? Real quick, two minutes. I'm going to take two minutes of your time, Stronger Moms Properties. And if you do like it, we'll give you a free set of stamps for any uh, mailers that you want to start doing. So we'll give you a free sheet of stamps. This is like, this is like 20 stamps. <laughs> Just kidding, it's only 10. But you get your, your first- That's $5. That's $5 right here. This is valuable. 
So if you do like it, raise your hand and we'll give you a sheet of stamps to get your mailers going. <laughs> Did you? You get one stamp. Them. Oh, one more. Oh, Irish good. Oh, Irish good. Okay. Did you like it? You like it? I'm gonna check. I know. I know who likes it. It's gonna show on Facebook, so you can't lie. I'm gonna take it back by the end of the night. Okay. So next slide. Um, we're gonna make this very short. 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. We're just gonna talk about flips. We're gonna jump straight into it. We have a special guest here. So I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'm gonna run through all the slides very, very fast. So if you, uh, just try to keep up, and then we'll, we'll learn more from uh, Sheila. OK, so next slide. So everyone always asks how, do, how to get started flipping. So first, the number one skill you should learn is how to analyze a deal. So there's this 70% rule that a lot of people talk about. And we're going to talk about what is that? So what is the 70% rule? Anyone knows what is 70%? Anyone want to describe it real quick? 70% rule, Christian? Right, it's 75% of the ARV, and it's a deal worth looking into. Yeah, okay, perfect, thank you. Great, great answer. So basically, you want to buy 70% discount. So just think of, think of yourself as going to the mall. When you go to the mall, you want to buy it at a discount. You want to buy things on sale. So if it's worth a million dollars, you want to buy it $700,000. Very <coughs> simple, straightforward. Uh, next slide. So here's a perfect example. If you, if you want to buy a house, um, let's say you buy for 700,000, you want to reserve 10% for, let's say, repairs, 100,000, 10% for closing costs, and then 10% for your profit. So pretty basic, from that 30%, 10% for repairs, 10% for closing costs, 10% for profit. So let's go to the next slide. And here's another rule that we go by, 150K uh, rule. So you can do this in smaller markets, let's say Oakland or um, Sacramento, where the price point is lower. But everything in San Jose is a million dollars, so that's why this rule doesn't apply. Therefore, we have a new rule, just for the Bay Area. We made this new rule, and it's called the 250K rule. So if you want to buy something with a big spread, so let's say you buy something for 800000 how much do you want to sell it for? A million fifty, yes. Yeah, you're so smart at math. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So um, there you go. So that's how flippers will look at the numbers in the Bay Area. And it gets more interesting. So the bigger the spread is, the better it is, right? Because so, you want to make more money. So it's actually easier to make more money in the high-end market than it is to make uh, more money in the low-end market because the spread is not as big. So we'll skim right through. So here's how we find deals. Um, we're gonna go, we didn't get a chance, to, we're not gonna get a chance to go over live on how we do it today since um, we're gonna <coughs> ask Sheila a lot of questions. But this is basically a run through of how we find deals. So pretty straightforward email campaign, thousands of real estate agents which we have a list for. And if you want to do that too, feel free to um, ask us for a list of email of a real estate agents. We have all that for any county, Alameda, uh, Contra Costa, Santa Clara. Just ask us and we'll provide you with that list. So wholesalers, let's go back real quick. Um, we get a lot of deals from wholesalers too. There are probably a few wholesalers here with deals, right? Can you raise your hands for those wholesalers? that might have a deal tonight that we can buy. Yeah? And then we can run over the numbers too. So raise your hand again, we can look around. So everyone probably has a deal in their head that they want to wholesale. So uh, pay attention to them, reach out to them, and ask them about their deals. 
So we're going to skip right through since we don't have too much time, but uh, let's go next slide. So quick email campaign, let's get through. How we fund the deals. So a lot of people ask, how do we fund our deals? We borrow a lot of our money. And we borrow a lot of our money through Iron Bridge Lending. So let's say we buy a house for a million dollars. We only have to down a hundred thousand dollars. So a million dollars down a hundred thousand dollars. That's uh, easier than a conventional loan. A conventional loan, you have to down twenty-five percent. Let's say we buy a house, million down ten percent. So where do we get that hundred thousand dollars? Any ideas? How can we raise that hundred thousand dollars? Private money. What's that? Private money? Yes. From from where? Here. From here. I'm sure people here have fifty, hundred thousand dollars in the bank, and they want to make twelve percent interest. How much is twelve percent interest a year on a hundred thousand? Twelve grand. That's not bad, right? So who would be happy to make twelve percent interest? We got a couple of people. So if you have a deal and you want to raise private money, reach out to those people that raise their hand. They have money to lend. So just yes. I have a question. Is twelve percent the average you're seeing for private money? You know, to get a second, or are you seeing higher? You know, like experience? Yeah. So it can vary. It can range from eight percent, ten percent, fifteen percent. If the deal is really, really good and the investor doesn't mind paying fifteen percent, they would pay fifteen percent. I've seen as high as twenty percent, but is someone willing to pay twenty percent? So it has to be a uh, happy medium between the two, the lender and the borrower. But twelve percent is pretty standard. Everyone goes off of that. Yeah, good question. Okay, so next slide. So we're gonna skip a lot of through this because you have the slides and we can email you the slides too. So let's go into, um, let's get this one. We have our contractors. Jose is our contractor in the back. So you have any construction questions, um, and you want a discount on your construction materials, <laughs> just ask Jose in the back. We'll set you up. Okay, next slide. Sorry, where's Jose? Uh, right there, with the nice glasses. Yeah, there you go. And we stage all of our houses. Yes? So. Just so that I fully understand, you raised 10% from private money. Yes. But where do you get the 90%? Oh, from the, the hard money. So hard money lender from, hard money. from Iron Bridge, Iron Bridge um, Home Lending. They're based out of Oregon. They're based out of Oregon. So Iron Bridge Home Lending. Yep. And every time we fix the house, we also want to stage the house. So we hire a staging company. And now they have a new um, the vision where they actually design your flips. So if you need help designing the cabinets and windows, I don't like doing any of that. So I like to hire them and make them do all the work because they're better at it. That's a nice house. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Looks familiar? I'm <laughs> wonder. Okay, next one. So how we learn how to flip meetups like this. So thank you guys for coming and taking initiative to actually learn how to flip more. Uh, Bigger Pockets is a great podcast. Okay, next slide. This is where we usually go towards the end, but we're gonna jump straight to our products just so you kind of see the numbers. So let's go next slide real quick. So this is case study number one. Uh, we bought this house for eight hundred thousand. Put in a hundred thousand, and we sold it for a million one fifty. So how big is that that spread from eight hundred to our sell price? <laughs> Three fifty. So that that beat on that satisfy all the rules, right? What the one fifty rule, the two fifty k rule. So this one's a three fifty k spread, and the best thing about it is we didn't have to put out any money. So we raised the ten percent. We use Iron Bridge, and then Iron Bridge give us a um, rehab loans. And then the monthly payments, we can raise that too. So a lot of this money is being raised. So you can actually start flipping with other people's money. So we put in 100,000, <coughs> made about 150 net after everything. But that's not including the hard money costs. So minus the hard money costs, maybe another 50,000. So next slide is another one. This is before. OK, Oakland Outlook. This one we got from a uh, wholesaler. He actually attends our meetup pretty often too. So Ray uh, hooked us up with this deal. There was like five other flippers that wanted it, but the only reason why we won right away 
uh, was because we submit the offer with no contingencies. Anyone knows what that means? No contingencies? Anyone want to explain what that means? As is. As is, yes. So our deposit is 3%, which is not much. 3% of 450 is how much? 12,000, non-refundable. So worst case, we just lose $12,000. But best case, we win the property, just like in this case. So we submit the offer as is, no contingencies. Uh, we didn't make that much, 50 grand, but still uh, just another product to do in our pipeline. So next. Sorry. Yes. On the details, so on the 90% loan, that, that's the first, that's in first position, right? That's first position, okay, and then, yeah. And then the private money or the 10% that you raise is second position. Second position, that's okay, correct. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Does the closing cost also uh, cover the, the tax? The closing cost? Tax? No, tax is uh, separate. Yeah, yeah, tax is based on your income and what you write off. Okay, so there, there will be some additional kind of additional costs. Yeah, 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 the, the yeah tax costs. Yeah. yeah. Yep. It, it, also, <coughs> it also depends on what entity you buy the house in and what entity you buy the, you sell the house in. Right, right. So S Corp or LLC. Yeah. yeah, yep. The so next one, this is the kitchen before, the kitchen after. Okay, next slide. Uh, this one's a very interesting one. This is one our friend did. He got this one off market from an agent. Um, he bought it for 665. So that sounds unreal, right? How can you buy a house for 665 in uh, Santa Clara? But he was actually able to do it in Santa Clara. I'm not sure how many bedrooms. Can someone look that up? How, how big is this house? One, three, two, four, Bellamy. Anybody want to look that up real quick? One, two, three, four, Bellamy. How big is this house? Two, two, three, two. Three, two? How many square feet? 1840. 1800 square feet. And you got it for 665. That's pretty amazing, even as is. That's a really, really low price. So I don't know how he did it. Maybe the owner didn't care about the price, or maybe the owner didn't want to pay tax, so I don't know. Um, but he was able to get it. He put in a lot of money. He basically rebuilt the whole house, uh, sold it for a million two, probably made a good 200,000. All this just in a matter of five months. So it wasn't like a, made, yes? Uh, what motivated the agent to give him an off-market lead? He gets the commission. So he gets to maybe double end the commission initially, and then he gets to relist the house with the agent. Yeah, so maybe we should look up who the agent is and find out <laughs> and ask them if they have more deals. <laughs> yeah, so that's a really, I really like his numbers and it's in South Bay. Everyone's saying South Bay is so hard to find a deal, but it's possible. You just have to keep on looking, looking, and looking. So next one is, this is the one that we're working on right now. Um, this deal came from Bernard right there. Bernard hooked us up with the deal. <laughs> That's his number, you can call him every single day for a deal. <laughs> Email him. He's just right there, he's not gonna run away. But this deal was uh, pretty good too. We bought it for 825, uh, put in 75,000. So that's 900, so we're gonna aim to sell for a million one. So how did you get this deal, Bernard, real quick? Uh, door knocking. Door knocking, okay. Yeah, so just door knocking the neighborhood. How big is the house? This house was 1,200, 1,300 square feet. But we're going to convert the basement. So San Francisco, we can convert the basement. Yeah, so last deal, then we'll start, um, we'll bring Sheila up after this. So oh. last one real quick. Oh. What's going to be your final square footage in Naples? Uh, Naples, maybe 1,800, 1,800 square feet. 1,150? Um, maybe um, more, but I like to be very conservative in the resale. Yeah, you're more, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're more, more than that. Maybe 1.2, yeah, 1.3. I'll give 1.4. Really? Yeah, okay. It's, it's one over a thousand. It's gonna be like, I'm going to have yeah. shit now. Yeah. Oh. I know. <laughs> I'll tell Bernard that. He's going to bump up his price. <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> okay, next one. So this one is a very, very recent one. The reason why I want to share this one too is because it's also 100% financing. So imagine our biggest purchase, 1.6 million, 1.6 million, 100% financing. So how did we do that? How did we raise 1.6 million dollars? Because of Rick. <laughs> Rick right here helped us find the investor that's willing to do a joint venture, 50-50. So if you have no money at all and you want to do a joint venture, 
ask Rick how to do it, because Rick's the one that helped us put this together. Uh, 1.6 million, we're gonna put in a lot of money to fix it, 400,000. So we're at 2 million, probably sell for 2.5. Okay. So that's 3.25. That's the, uh, the idea value, but I like to be conservative. <laughs> but if it hits 3 million. But the house two doors down is over 3. Six. So 4.5, yeah. 4.5. So, so two doors down is going for 4.5. And he's trying to actually say that's 2.5. There's no freaking way. Very, very it's conservative. Be, yes. This is like worst case scenario. Minimum. Yeah, minimum. It's going to be a million dollar profit right Yeah. Now. So it's a nice one. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. Yeah, very nice one. So thank you, Rick, for making that happen. Thank we you. close this in seven days. Can you believe that? Seven days, all cash, no money out of our pocket. We just owe Rick a lot of money now. So how, did, how does one find the investor? <laughs> really no, no, it's like when I was actually networking, I actually came across the guy um, in Costco, going to his car with his wife, peeks in his hand, and I said, oh, didn't I see you at the Real Estate Investor Club last week? And he said, no, uh, but I need to get in real estate. And I said, why? I just sold my company to Wells Fargo, and I want to get into real estate. So, and he just said, I said, well, you need to meet our team, our, our meetup group team, our mastermind team, and meet some of my partners. The deal got done in seven days. Seven days, and yeah, we don't even know this guy. I met him. <laughs> he just met him at Costco. <laughs> so I'm gonna so walk, walk around Costco, Costco every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, so we put that together. We're going to put it back in the market in six months. So let's see what happens in six months. If we're going to hit three million or not. Okay, so. Yeah. So I'm Sheila, and I met Tom a couple years ago, I think. At a meetup. At another meetup. That's right. Um, and so we had met, um, I can't remember, I think it was Bo at Bo's meetup. Yeah. And so we kept in touch, and he started Stronger Moms, and turns out I'm a mom. And I flip homes, and so this is how this came about. That's right. And so I've been flipping homes um, for the past four years, passively, it, sort of part time. So I don't do it full time because I still stay at home with my daughter. She started kindergarten in the fall, so I'm looking at scaling my business. And I brought on Samir in the back there. He's my business partner now, um, so we can start scaling and, and doing more properties at once. Nice. Um, so that's me. I've done 14 in the past four years. Um, again, I stay at home with my daughter full time, um, and then do this part time. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. All the way from San Diego. <laughs> she flew down just for us. All right. So let's um, <coughs> let's jump into the question and answer. I just thought of random questions to ask, and then feel free <coughs> to um, add in more. So as we're asking questions, I'm going to type down notes so we can share with you guys after. So view, 100%. How do you like the spotlight, Sheila? It's, it's red and unusual for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little awkward. I apologize. <laughs> OK, first, how did you guys start in real estate? Um, so in our, my, so when I was doing architecture, I was working for a new home builder. Um, so I picked up properties as passive income, so rentals, and I started in that capacity. And then I started doing my own personal properties on the side as well to my career. And so that's easy to do, right? You, you purchase something that you put in sweat equity, you live in it for, uh, in Canada it's a year, but in the U.S. it's two years, and then you don't have to pay capital gains. You get some equity and then you do the process all over again so long as you don't mind moving all the time um, but that's how I started and then I you know started with my family and didn't want to have a nine-to-five job and I started my own business it sort of fell into place and this is what I practiced in and what I'm familiar with easy segue so it worked out for me great very nice so work for a new home builder you think that helped out a lot um, get started or you recommend um, it definitely gives you a good background and a good base because yeah. I worked with clients do million dollar homes. I helped them design the floor plans, yeah. picked all their finishes, and you know worked with budgets and so forth as well. So it gave me a really good base in this industry. So I have I bring a lot of value in that I do all the scope of work. I do all the design myself. 
Wow. Uh, one of the projects you'll see I did uh, from scratch. We tore down 1350, <coughs> built a two-story 2650. I did all the design work, hired a, a draft person, and then had an engineer stamp because I'm not licensed in the U.S. because I'm Canadian originally, and I've been in the U.S. for maybe six years now, seven years. That's it? Yeah. That's and so um, it's been a good foundation for me, and a, a, I think partly definitely uh, why I've been so successful more than some other investors because you do have a good base. The biggest, I think, issue that a lot of investors first stumble across is how do we get this construction budget under contract? How do we get a contractor? What do I need to do? What is good at, you know, which parts do you want to invest in? Do you want the $500 sink or was this, you know, $100 sink going to, to work? So that really helped me be successful in the last couple of years, for sure. How long did you work with them, the new home construction? Um, probably almost a, almost a decade. That long? Right. Wow, so right. basically you were flipping for them. <laughs> for 10 years? Sort of. Wow. Oh, sort of. Underpaid. Ten years. <laughs> What's that? I'm sure underpaid. <laughs> <laughs> Did they give yes. you any equity in the deals? I wish. That no? would be great. Yeah. Okay, we'll hire you. <laughs> John, let's do we need to this? Or? Very cool. So started in Canada. You think, um, this is just random, but you think it's harder there or here? The market is very different there yeah. to here. So there's not, there's no short sales in Canada. Yeah. Um, there's, the, the mortgages are different. Yeah. Generally, Canadians are a little more conservative uh -huh. with their spending, so you won't find a lot of people underwater. Yeah. You don't get a lot of deals in that respect. So the market is very different. Um, different mentality, different price points yes. all across the, the, so I wouldn't say easier or harder yeah. in one way, because there's still investors flipping in Canada, of course, and yeah. there are here. So it's just a different way to do Business. the same thing. So there's right. more foreclosures here in America. Yes. Because we're irresponsible <laughs> Americans. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll write that down. <laughs> I have credit card debt too. Yes. Okay, very nice. So America's easier because of people like us. <laughs> <laughs> so when you first started, how do you buy your first flip project? Um, and then we're going to look up your flip product online, is that okay? And yeah. And kind of see how that worked out for you. So let me move this side by side. My neck kind of hurts. Maybe I should scoot this way. Okay. Okay, how did you buy your first flip project? How much was it, by the way, your first flip project? My first in this capacity? That's a good uh, question. Yeah. Um, I think it was 800. So 800K. Roughly. So it's um, been a while. So my, and my, <laughs> I don't even remember the one, three, three projects ago, unfortunately. So. No problem. Do you remember the address? <laughs> I don't. Okay, we'll make up something. Let's make up any product that you remember um, in the beginning phase. Any of them? I don't, I, I honestly, and then I brought a cheat sheet, which I yeah. forgot. <laughs> it was terrible. Okay, no problem. So, so I first started, and what I always recommend for first time investors, you definitely get a mentor. So you want somebody with experience under your wing or you under their wing. So if you come into any issues or any obstacles, you have you've somebody who has your back, who can you can ask questions, and who's experienced it. So Tom can give your number out to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that's you know very important to find somebody that you can lean on, that you can trust, and that will teach you and take you through the steps. Um, and so I had a mentor, and I started with, and his name is John Paiva. I don't know if anybody has knows him. He speaks at other meetups in San Jose. And, um, so I met him through a mutual contact, and he's, you know, an amazing mentor. He's taught me so much, and then, you know, at a point I caught up to him, and now he's giving me people to mentor and teach. And so... I think it's great and you know we both have the mindset that you want to give back to the community you want to help other people you know he didn't charge me I don't charge people you know it's just that you want to help it, I mean, this whole entire network is really a small group of people that are actually investing so you all want to help each other do and do you know make everything a win-win as opposed to you know you, want, you don't want to hold that information close you want to share it and then we all are successful 
So. Awesome. So that's just four years ago, huh? Right. Four years ago. And right. now you're flipping more houses than him. Why? Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, very nice. Are you looking for students? Um, I'm always open to it. My time is limited with yeah. a, a, with a five year old, but okay, we're all signing up. up. <laughs> we're all signing up for your class. <laughs> Whenever your next class is. Okay. So you bought this for eight hundred thousand. Do you remember how much you put in the house? I don't. Oh, I, that's, unfortunately, that's, those deals are. Yeah. It's been a while, and yeah. I unfortunately. It's okay. You can make it up. <laughs> we'll, we'll know. Well, you you're good with that. <laughs> I'll leave. You'll leave that to you. But okay. I typically fund my deals through investors, private money investors, hard the money thing? lenders. Private. Um, pretty much. So there are deals when I'm doing consecutive deals. I will bring my money, of course, and mm -hmm. invest it as well. But I have investors from. I mean, I have high school friends. Yeah. Um, and just as I'm Canada, I'm terrible with names, just as you had said, right. I talked to my OBGYN. You know, I was we were what is that we're having my. We need some. Is that for women? Doctor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna ask my mom tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe not your mom. Maybe somebody else. <laughs> Okay, you just, you just network and you just talk. <laughs> great advice, great advice. <laughs> No, it's just funny. I'm still reaching out. That's right. You hit them up for some money. So, I, you know, I have high school friends that invest with me. How much they, did you give for them at interest? Um, so my interest varies, and mm -hmm. depending on their experience level, I will offer them. If they're investing in, you know, GICs or. At, you know, savings in a bank, getting 1%, yeah. and they're not looking to learn anything, to do anything, they just want to give you your money. My points range anywhere from 8 to 12, and I've paid investors 15%. So I tend to be maybe a little bit more generous than most people. If my profit margin is larger, I'm happy to pay you more, make it a win-win for everybody, and then you continue investing with me. So. That's sort of my motto throughout. I'm with my contractors, with my agents, with my investors. I make sure everybody is win-win. It's a happy environment. Everybody makes money. Everybody goes away happy, and we want to keep doing deals together. Okay, very nice. Do you like mini invest in San Diego area right now? Or I actually have not done any in San Diego, okay. ironically. So I mainly invest in the Bay Area. Ironically, um, before I met my ex-husband. I was supposed to move to the Bay Area because I knew and have a really big network here. And so I was able to network a little bit more and then meet the right key investors and, and so forth. Um, and the margins are much larger here, of course, than they are in San Diego. So, so you're going to move here soon? <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> How often did you have to travel with your first project? Um, yes, so the first project there was a lot of traveling. So um, I would come up, meet the contractor, and I always had either a partner that I joined, ventured with, or you know somebody like Samir who I've brought on now as a full-time business partner who has boots on the ground, and then I do sort of the managing of everything else. So it's integral, it was always integral for me to find somebody I could trust here that could at least go and take pictures weekly so that I wasn't flying up every week. But I, at the beginning, I was coming up maybe three or four times per project. And now I come up maybe once, if that. Right. When you have them take pictures for you, what are you mostly looking at? <clears throat> so during the construction phase, um, everything, so I, again, with your contractor, there's several formats in which you can pay your contractor and what you want to set up. So what I like to do is, you know, I like to pay my contractors as things is done. I'm happy to pay you weekly, bi-weekly, whatever you need. So if they are interested in a, in a weekly payment, I'll have Samir go and he'll take pictures of, you know, the progress, what you're getting paid on, what materials, things like that, so that I can see what you've done and then ensure that your payment is on time with your progress. Uh, what about for acquiring property when you're buying sign and so I typically, ironically, buy most of my properties sight unseen, even my passive properties, just because I have a ton of experience in that. So I look at all the pictures I'm able, with my knowledge and my background, to piece together a house through photos. And because I've had so much experience with budget and contractor budgets, I'm able to build a scope of work based on pictures. So it's, you know, once you get to that point, it's easy to do. And then, you know, I, I put in a bid. I do my desktop analysis in five minutes, and then I can, you know, give an offer or put in a, 
have my agent put in an offer, and then go from there. Anything in particular, like looking for cracks in the windows or? Yeah, you want to look at everything. So as many pictures as you can, big cracks. Um, and in, typically, Samir will pick those up or whomever we go to have look at those pictures. You want to look at windows. You want to you know, count windows. You want to um, count doors. You want to look at door frames. You want to look at structure of cabinets, structure of, of walls. You want to be very thorough in your first walk because it is such a competitive market. You want to make sure that you are thorough with your budget you're not you know 50 100 K off and then all of a sudden now you put in an offer that's way too high so you want to be thorough on the first go because it is competitive there's you know multiple offer situations and you want to get in there quick like Tom said with no contingencies and or you know very few sure can I ask you a question yeah. is there a level of distress that you kind of that you wouldn't go into so there hasn't been for me because of my background so again, I had picked up a project in Willow Glen that it was a complete teardown. I added maybe three or four feet of foundation and then I just <coughs> used that foundation. And we did have to repair some of the foundation and then built it up. So for me, because I have experience as an architect, foundation doesn't concern me because I know how to fix it. And so I go from the gamut of foundation issues from ground up to um, you know, lipstick and rouge, so you just change the carpet and the, the paint and so forth. But as long as that has been disclosed to you. Right, right, yes. How many offers do you make in a week? Um, you know what, we don't actually make a ton because we have a lot of, so we're in a position now where I've networked, where I have wholesalers and I have investors and I have agents bring me deals. And so very often they may seem like good deals, but I'll do my desktop analysis and they're not what we're looking for and we're in a good position where I'm able to cherry pick my deals and then I'm not at a point where I'm doing 15 at a time so I'm picking the the great projects that we like and that's and then I'll put an offer in so typically in a week um, we yeah maybe a month we'll put in a couple okay. yeah so your closing ratio is pretty high right right I'm kind of curious um, can you quickly talk about all your flips? I mean, like, which one was, like, caused you the most trouble? Did you, uh, like, did you lose any money in your flips? That's what I was wondering. Yes. And why? So I have not um, lost any money in any of my flips. There's, um, this, we will get to it. I think it's part of our presentation, but it, the project, the fourplex that we have, that is closing escrow in two days to a seller. Um, so that has been, unfortunately, a little bit of a nightmare because we had tenants in there paying 650. San Jose is a tenant-friendly, you know, state, um, and so we had issues getting those tenants out. We had issues with contractors. We had, you know, did the bidding system. They came in. We found. We thought we found a great guy. His workers left. Um, you know, he wasn't able to get more people. We did quickly bring in another contractor. We got the cap rates that we wanted listed, and unfortunately, because the neighborhood's not in the best neighborhood, there's you know some homeless people in the back that sort of affected our ARV. So we listed actually at one six five, based on the cap rate of five you know over five percent ROI, and we ended up selling at one four seven. So we still make money on that, just not as much. And so you, you know, you you account for that buffer, and that's we're like Tom. We like to go very conservative with our numbers, and then everything else is bonus and a gravy. Where was the property? Uh, it's eight three two Gene Avenue. Little person back. Eight three two. Check it out. Eight three two. Okay, we'll take a look after. As a wholesale buyer, what ROI are you looking for? I think it really depends. I don't have a set budget, so it depends what the project is. If it's a, a one month, two month, I'm happy to make a smaller profit. If it's really quick and it just needs cabinets and paint, if it's a total rebuild, obviously we want a bigger profit in that sense. So it really just is numbers, and then depending on how quickly we can get it done or how much needs to be done. So how much would you like to make, let's say on a small project, 50 grand, is that enough for you? Or you like to do bigger products now, So right, 100 grand? Right, so we do bigger projects on the bigger end and we, you know, minimally six six figures. Six figures, how much is that? 
We need a calculator. I don't know, Tom, you're only dealing with seven figures. Is that a million? Six figures. Very nice. Okay, we'll check out your deals out there. Uh, any more questions before I run through some more? How much is in her bank account? <laughs> so, Samir and I actually met through my mentor. He had gone to one of those um, investor meetings and he was asking to be help to partner with John, and John is at his capacity. So, John has been wonderful, and so whenever somebody wants to partner with John and he's at his capacity, he sends them to me. If anybody wants to learn anything, John's at his capacity, he sends them to me. And so we sort of met in that capacity, and it worked out. You know, Samir is a great guy, and we had similar, uh, you know, obviously similar likes and interests and like-minded, and he wanted to learn as well, so it worked out well. So he's not my OBGYN, though. Can you share with us your best as well as the most challenging projects that you have done? Um, the most challenging definitely, I think, um, was this one, this fourplex, with the multiple pieces of the tenants, not, you know, the initial tenants not wanting and willing to go out, you know, I had to pay them um, some amount um, to, to move out willingly because with the rent control in San Jose, I had one tenant in for $650. So if you can imagine, you're not making anything with tenants living in your property for 650 So managing those pieces to try and find, you know, what their spot is, what's, you know, and these are people that lived in their home for 10 years. So you want to have that compassion where you're not just like, you hey, get out. So you have to find that balance. And then with the contractor that we brought on that didn't work out so well, we had to bring on another one that ended up with time delays as well. And then finding tenants as well at the price point we needed to hit our ROI. So I think that's definitely been one of the more challenging projects that so I've what's, had. What's that contractor's name? <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And then um, we've had some really good ones. I think your, your really good one would be that you pick up the project at a really good price. You have no issues uh, with your contractor, which unfortunately is rare in this, this now. Um, and then you sell, you know, over asking price. You mentioned you had to pay the tenant to move out? Right. How much is that? It, it was, it ranged. So yeah. anywhere from six to 10. Six to 10,000? Right. That's not too bad compared to uh, Berkeley. Right, one I know, Berkeley is crazy. Yeah, one time the tenant asked for $300,000 so they could buy another house. Right. <laughs> and you said? I said, sure, why not? <laughs> I like living there. You're right. I gotta live with you, right? I have a question. Um, so the strategy that you started with is still the strategy that you're going with, it's just flipping. Are you ever going to get into like a rental property or into rental properties or? So I have in the past, um, and I've also property managed myself as well as hired property manager. So right now for my own mentality, I'm not investing in rentals. Um, just because I have so much on my plate personally with my daughter, you know, I don't want to spend as much time as I can with her with my own active business. And so if I can find other investors that I can invest my money in, make 12%, you know, have no vacancy rates, let's do that rather than rentals where you have um, tenants that you've made, you know, you have many issues, if, especially if you're investing in California. Um, there's other properties I've invested in Indiana and Memphis, um, and you have different issues in different states. So for me, I don't invest in rentals right now just because where I'm at personally, it's too much. I want to be completely passive. Here's my money, give me some money, we're good. Stop looking at How are you determining the ARVs? Like what is, you don't just look at all like Zillow, like what is the process of determining how much this you think this will sell for? So, Again, um, it, you do, I have agents that bring me comps, and then you, you are just 
par uh, pulling up recent solds. You do within the neighborhood, within, ideally you want to find something within one mile radius, not across the freeway, not on a busy street. So you want to find exact comps that have similar square footage, similar uh, lot sizes, and you want to make sure that they're comparable in that sense. So you are just looking online for your comps. If you don't have MLS access, then it would be, you know, Zillow, Redfin, you know, whatever not. And then just through experience, I'm able to, to understand and know what you're comparing, what you're looking at in that sense. <coughs> the same materials in every flip you do? Um, it, so I do have a cheat sheet. So I do have chosen. So for the more simpler ones, I will just give my contractor, these are the materials. And then in the nicer ones where we're trying to get, like a, maybe in this uh, duplex in Sunnyvale, it's a little more customized. You want to add different things. Or the Willow Glen project I did, I chose everything otherwise. So what I like to do before a project even starts is I give my contractor a complete scope of work. So I will go out in that time they're bidding the project to choose all my finishes, wet, you know, whomever. So I have my subs and then we have con the contractors that bring their own subs as well. And I'll make a complete list and then here you go, you don't have to hear from me and then they just go do the work. So it is easier if you're doing <coughs> projects in the same price point to do something similar all the time because then you're saving time. But again, if you're in different markets like we are, different price points, it doesn't quite work that way. It doesn't work as well. And so what I've also found in that respect um, is I also do a lot of research to who's buying in that neighborhood. So what I've noticed with a lot of other investors is they'll pick a color scheme, but it doesn't work in a first time new buyer market because they like something completely different and now your house is sitting. Or you choose a Victorian scheme and they don't like Victorian now in this market. So I do a lot of research in that respect as well when I'm designing who's buying, what's going off the shelf faster, is it contemporary, is it modern, is it you know country style, is it Spanish style, whatever style is going out the door faster, that's what I'm going to put into this house. Uh, Sheila, regarding the contractors, are you finding that you're using the same contractor for 80% of your deals, in other words, <coughs> Pareto principle? Or I really are wish. Using, are you using a different contractor for each one? Unfortunately, we are using different contractors. That seems to be a problem throughout the industry right now, that there's not a good amount of contractors that are great for more than two jobs. So they typically will end up being great for two, maybe three properties. And then, you know, sometimes uh, what I found is they're not very good at organizing. So they'll either spread themselves too thin with multiple projects and or then they start seeing, well, you're making this much and I'm only making this much. I want to start making this much. So their numbers go up, their prices go up. And then, you know, obviously you want to stay within your budget. So then it's not working and meeting your needs again. And that's why Unfortunately, I haven't used one contractor. It would be great, and when I'm at a point where I've scaled enough, I will have an in-house contractor, and that would be ideal. But at this point, unfortunately, we've not found the golden contractor. Um, in your contract with contractor, do you have penalties for missing deadlines? Right, yes, absolutely. So we have penalties and we have bonuses. <coughs> Again, I try to make it a win-win for everybody, uh -huh. and then it incentivizes them to finish faster as well. And then, of course, I have my contractors dictate, will you tell me how long it'll take in a reasonable amount of time, and then that's when I bring in the penalty clause. So you don't want to bring that in too soon because then they say, well, actually it's eight, you know, two, three months, as opposed to realistically it's six weeks. So always have you know, penalties and bonuses in place to keep everybody accountable for what, they, what they're saying. And on the average of the deals that you've done, how often have you triggered the penalty clause? Uh, it really depends whether we want to work with a contractor again, also is a big factor. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely have put it into place. Um, I, that's sort of my last resort because I, I don't like to, to penalize um, just because it's good to have in place and then depending on my numbers, I'll, I'll, Gene, we had to put it into place, unfortunately because it was cutting into our profit too much. But very generally, I won't because it, you know, I try to make it a win-win for everybody regardless. Thank you. 
I guess, um, what's the average time frame per flip that you've uh, worked on? I guess the shortest, longest, and average. Uh, so the shortest has been two months. The longest has been about nine months. And then the average is about four. Yeah. So are you ever afraid of like recession <coughs> hitting or like this market's no longer hot or warm or whatever it is? Um, um, you too. definitely want to keep that in mind. Uh, we fortunately live in Bay Area. Mm -hmm. We're in a bubble. So I think uh, just with the foreign investors coming into play and the, all the ex you know tech expansion, this bubble is going to continue for, I think it might even out for a little bit, but it's not going to burst. So you want to also look at the, the markets, and they're all very uh, dependent on where it is. So in a, in, a, in a market like Indiana, it's very cyclical. It's very, um, sorry, it's very steady. So it only gains and appreciates 4% every year. It doesn't, you know, even if it bursts, it's not a big burst. But you do definitely want to keep that in mind. You want to have your flips in a much shorter duration in case you do buy too high and your expenses, you know, construction budget went through the roof. You want to make sure that you're not caught with your pants down. Sure. For sure. Questions? Sure. In the very new era lease, how much are you looking at the appreciation? So I don't ever look at appreciation. I base it on, so for me, I never speculate. I ne if the market goes up, that's a bonus for me. But I never base any of my ARVs on speculation because that's how you get into hot water. You lose money. You start chasing the deal. You start bidding more because you think, well, the market's going to accumulate. But nobody can predict the market. Nobody has, you know, a crystal ball. And you never want to chase that if you're in the profit, in the market to make money. And so you have to have that mindset like Tom does. You be more conservative. If the market appreciates, that's extra money for you, that's great. But you never want to chase that because you end up then paying too much and then things happen, the market crashes or the market shifts or it's winter or it's Christmas or you know construction take, took too long and then you don't hit your market and then you, know, you might be in the red. How conservative do you get? Um, do you have like a base, like five, ten percent, two percent? I don't necessarily have a base. I base it on current market values, and so if current market value says today it's, um, you know, one point five, uh, I'm not going to speculate that in two months it may appreciate five percent, five, you know, ten percent. I don't know, so I don't ever have a number in that sense. So you do your CMAs at the time you're purchasing the properties. Right. right, right. Okay, cool. Thank you. Do you have like a plan B? So you're not speculating that the market will go up, but you speculate in case it goes down? Um, it, so really, you want to purchase at a good price. And that is where you make your money, is on the buy rather than the sell. So as long as you are buying below market value, current market value, you're always going to be pretty safe because the market's not going to go that much lower. And even at that point, if you need to sell it without doing absolutely anything, you can make your money back. We're pretty quiet on the left side. Let's <laughs> <laughs> the there. Okay. No more arts history. Uh, going back to uh, ARV real quick, if you want access to the MOS, we actually can provide access to the MOS <clears throat> with our assistant logins. So what is the assistant logins? Basically means you're our assistant technically, but not really. So go ahead and use our logins as much as you want. And um, yes. Is that MLS access just for the Bay Area, or is it countrywide? Um, Bay Area, Sacramento, San Francisco, Santa Cruz, Stockton, our, our close areas, LA too. So most of California. Yeah, so we have the login. And we have videos on YouTube. So just put, search, search on YouTube on how to run comps on MOS. So you look right here, YouTube, how to run comps. The MOS is called REIL. How to run comps, REIL. 
So if you like hearing my voice, you can listen to my voice every night for like 20 minutes. Right there. You don't get to see me though, you only get to hear me. So imagine how I look. Imagine me in a nice outfit. Right there. Tom runs a different business on the site. <laughs> it's it's multi-talented. There we go. All right. So there answers your question on how to run comps and how to access MOS. So let's go back to Sheila. Let's see, what other questions do we have for you? Um, how are you winning offers today? Are you putting a big deposit, one day closing, or what are you doing? How are you winning today? So typically you will win with no contingencies and a very short um, closing period. So my periods are usually seven to 10 days. Seven to 10 days. Um, and then I'll, I won't have appraisal, I won't have inspections. Um, I'll do that on the first go. You know, you bring your contractor with you, he can give you the rundown on price points and then you tighten up everything, uh, make sure that you have proof of funds, work with your agent. Uh, and then also typically what helps is you wait until the last minute and see how your agent talk to the other agent and say, you know, try to get some information. What price do we need to get at to win? What, you know, so you're kind of digging for more information and then you wait to be the last offer. Wait to be the last offer. So a lot of investors that I've talked to are not comfortable going into an offer non-contingent, not even without a three-day contingency period to inspect. If you're, if you're, you know, a plane trip away, how, how are you able to submit a non-contingent offer, a completely as-is offer? So you remember that gentleman back there? <laughs> he does all my work on the ground. So he'll go and look at the project. Um, he'll take photos. We'll just get, get on the phone, a quick phone call, and we'll discuss you know, what price point we want to get, get into, how much construction is. He'll send me videos. He'll send me photos. Everything I need to do, what I need to do, is make assessments for contract and budget and price point. What about square footage? What if there's a discrepancy with the square footage and you went in non-contingent? Uh, very seldom have I ever run into that issue. It, if there's a discrepancy, it's you know, 10, 15, 20, 50 feet at least, which does not necessarily affect my ARV. When you're looking at 100 plus, of course there, there's discrepancies, but all that is disclosed typically through the selling agent or sellers. Do you use hard money loans at all? I do, yes. Does so, that require appraisal for you? I'm sorry? Does that require uh, an appraisal for your hard money loan? Um, I have a good rapport with my, uh, my hard money lender. So I've been working with them for a couple of years. I get really good rates uh, with them. So they will do their own appraisal, but they will allow me, because we built the rapport, not to do appraisal contingencies. What about sharing? the beginning then? Um, yeah, so I work with Conventus. Conventus. Oh. Okay. And they don't, they don't have an appraisal? They, they, don't they do, do their own appraisal. So they will do their own appraisal, but I can still go in non-contingent. Right. Do you have really good terms with them? I do. Really? Can you stay on the other one? <laughs> <laughs> so I have um, 8%, 8.9 and 8 1 point. 8.9 and 1 point. Wow. Can we ask them for your rate? <laughs> oh, that's better than yours. I know. <laughs> you gonna do some more talking I and know. videos together? I guess. I'm gonna say uh, she was my partner. <laughs> and I'll say I don't know Tom. Never <laughs> met Tom. Uh, Sheila, I'm, I'm having trouble picturing the structure of your deal. I was wondering if we could walk through it a little slower. So you're going in with uh, an all-cash offer, basically, right? Right. Uh, closing in seven to ten days. Right. So uh, what inspections or what contingency do you have where if you see something that you don't like, you can walk out or walk, walk away? Or is there a rough one? I don't know. So I typically won't put in an offer unless I know that all the numbers make sense. Okay. So for me, I don't, I don't chase anything. I don't raise my numbers. Um, and then very often we have a lot of deals that come in through trusted investors that you know they give me the number. I've worked with them for years, or you know I've trusted them, um, and we just do a deal in that sense. What does that mean? I'm sorry. Um, so be because I built a rapport with 
my wholesalers or my other investors that bring me the deal, uh -huh. we will formulate a deal through ourselves. We won't work through agents. And then, uh, right. So if if you are doing something off the of MLS, you're not familiar with the other agent, you're not familiar with the seller, you do often want to put in contingencies. And I, if I really want the offer, I'll put in no contingencies, but I've done all my homework ahead of time. So if you haven't done your homework, which is bring your contractor in, get your contra uh, contracting budget in play, know exactly how, mu how much that is, you definitely want to put in contingencies because you don't want to be locked in and then all of a sudden find right. out that... Okay, so you're bringing your contractor in before you put the offer in. Right. Okay. So, Sorry, it wasn't so, clear. Of course, okay. yeah. Got it. Got it. You mentioned it was really hard to get contractors. They're willing to, you first identify one that you think you're gonna use that walks in on these a lot of these deals. Like, how does that work? So sometimes we'll have a contractor that we've used in the past yeah. that will come with us. Okay. And then, so what we do is we leverage the different contractors. So we'll have one guy that's doing a project here. Can you come look at this one for us? And we give them the carrot, right? If you come, take a look, you might get this project but you also have to put in a good bid. See, there's lots of pieces attached to that. And we generally have a project in play, so we always have at least one contractor. And then because I have a lot of experience, I, you know, Samir will take really good photos, and then I won't need to bring the contractor at all. Are most of your projects on the MLS? Um, no, okay. no. So a lot of off-market projects. MLS deals right now are really tight and they're very slim. So because the market as well has a lot of savvy buyer sellers now, people want top dollar and they know that they're going to get multiple offers. So it's really hard as an investor to pay a little bit more than a retail buyer because they're going to live there, they're going to live there for the next 10 years, they're willing to pay a little bit more. So I typically get all my offers off-market. You were talking about agents, so that's where I got confused. You said, I'll have my agent do this and my Market agent deals. do that. Right, so I work with a network of agents as well, mm -hmm. and they bring me deals, and we do the same as Tom. So if they bring me a deal, I'll rehab the project, okay. they get to sell it again and relist it. Just talking about pocket deals too, so. Right, yeah. 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 So there's very often agents will get work with. Um, one of their sellers, and then all of a sudden their neighbor wants to sell. So now they have an off-market property. Well, we, we've, you know, you've worked with our neighbor, you're doing a great job, do you have anybody that can uh, buy our place as well? And then we'll be on the top of the list for those agents that we've worked with in the past, and or we're always calling agents to build rapport, to work with them, to try and work with them in a capacity, and sort of climb up that ladder to be their first person to call when they have a property. Isn't it the duty of the agent to try to get the most money they can for the seller? Um, it, it, you definitely, there, I think for agents, you definitely want to do that. And there's, so there's different agents. There's some agents that won't work with investors at all because, you know, we definitely want um, under market value. But we're also not paying, you know, we're not buying a home for 800 at 300 we're not under market that much more. And then there's agents that are willing to work with investors knowing that they're gonna get a double end commission in that respect. So it really depends on the agent and who you come across and what their values are. Um, and again, it's not to say that we're undercutting anybody in that sense because there's a lot of sellers who are baby boomers who are 90 who don't want to do a thing, they don't want to list it, they don't want to have to clean up their home every day so that when somebody comes up, somebody comes through, they have to present it and it's showing, they just want to sell it. So in that respect, you have tons of people who say, well, I just, this is my number, go find me a buyer. So there's lots of agents who get off-market deals in that respect as well. So who's your favorite agent? Tom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've just about been that one, Good right? <laughs> okay, next question. <clears throat> Can you tell us who are the key members of your team? <clears throat> so we know about Samir's story. Is there anyone um, else on your team besides Samir? That is it for now because I'm I'm still <clears throat> not 
um, doing a tremendous volume. It's yeah. just Samir and I for the, the interim. Wow. Um, and then when we look at scaling, you want to bring on a project manager. You want to bring on an in-house contractor. Um, and agents, I, we don't really classify them as on our team, but they are part of our team on a broader sense. Any assistants, sure. uh, bookkeeper, anything like that as well? Um, yeah, I, we have bookkeepers. We have, I work with an accountant. I, everything that I don't have knowledge on, I farm out for somebody else. So uh, as you build, you definitely want to have a bookkeeper. Um, and I have a great bookkeeper that she's in San Diego, but she works remotely as well. Um, and a, obviously a very good CPA. Yay. Okay. All right. So now we're going to get to your um, recent project. So we can pull up the two that you emailed over to us. You want to talk about those ones? Sure. Okay. So let's pull which one Which one you like the most right here. Windsor. Um, we can talk about Lu uh, Louise. Is a, um, that recent, but this yeah. is the one that I tore down. Uh, 1350 and built a two-story 2650 square foot. Wow. Two-story. Wow. So you tear the whole house down. Right. How long did that take? Nine months. Nine, Nine months? months? Right. So fast. That's fast. Oh, yeah. That's fast. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wow. It was pretty quick. Can we just give you our, our money? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> okay, let's look this one up. So sure. let's see. Let's be nosy. Let's see what we can find as much as possible. Um, just based what we find online. Okay, Zillow. Zillow's nice since it has a price history. So we're gonna know how much money you made. <laughs> so let's look here. Let's scroll down. Sheila, while he's pulling that up, so did you design it, the architecture oh. design? Yes. So you nice. bought this. Thank you. I like it. In January. <laughs> Wait. How much you buy it for? <laughs> Definitely not that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a great negotiating. Yeah, so <laughs> definitely wow. not that. <laughs> okay. So we bought that one off market. Uh -huh. And so I, that's why I don't think it's listed. I see. Uh, for nine seventy five. Nine seventy five. Okay, so let's round it off. So let's uh, round off to a million dollars. And so how much? Do you know why they don't list that sometimes? I don't know. Why? Did you pay that? I, no, I, I'm asking you because <laughs> I, I don't know why I don't, know. don't have that history sometimes. So you said 875? Oh, 975. 975. So we'll round off just for simple numbers. And you said you tear down the house, um, tear it down, and you built a house. How big? 2650. 2650. So what is the average cost per square feet to build nowadays? Um, I think 250 to 350. 250 to pretty 350. Average. It's been a while since I built from scratch. Yeah, so let's say round off to 300 times 2650 square feet. Who's good at math? 300 times 265. Like How much is that? 785. 789? 795. 795? Okay, 795. And we'll round it off to 800K. So you bought it for a million, put in 800K, let's say architecture, everything, right? Then how much did you sell it for? So I definitely didn't pay 800 to oh. rebuild. Really? Yeah. Yes. So it's less? Much less. Wow, so yes. you negotiated right. uh, really well. Yes. How long? So I ended up uh, paying, I think, 360. What? To build? Oh. Right. So that's what? half the cost? Right. right. So who? <laughs> we all want to know who's your contractor. No wonder the contractor wants more money. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so really, the cost per square feet for you only costs 150. Why is that? Why? Uh, How that, did you do? that was a really good contractor. Really? <laughs> I have no explanation. It worked out really well. Was it the materials well. or why? Uh, definitely materials. So materials. how I work with contractors is I rarely negotiate their price yeah. in that I will come and say, you know what, instead of the $5 laminate, I'm going to choose a dollar thirty laminate. So that's how really? I reduce cost because what I've come across is when you start negotiating with contractors just on a whole number basis, they don't really like that because then they, they start feeling like that they're being taken advantage of or, you know, this is not what they want or, you know, and they sort of begrudgingly want to work with you because they want to build their, their rapport and want to work with investors, 
but what I've experienced is then at that respect contractors then you know don't finish the job they don't do what they have spec or they start cutting corners and so you definitely don't want to have a project that goes on that's half done or you know you're wasting time or that doesn't look up to standard for what you want um, so very typically I will come back and negotiate on finishes so instead of you know the fifty dollar I you know five hundred thousand or sorry five thousand um, dollar slab of granite I have a supplier over here that's only two hundred and fifty dollars for a slab wow. so I will go out and find some trades and subs and then start subbing in some of their materials <clears throat> and then you know labor has to be a factor as well so you you have to weed out those contractors who are working for retail pricing. So you're telling us this million dollar, how much you sold this for? 1.8. 1.8, so this is $250 right here for this slab? <laughs> for just the top slab. Oh, just the top the, part. The two on the side is additional. Wow, that's really nice. <laughs> Not bad for 250 bucks. Yeah. So let's look online again. So you, where is Zillow? The pictures might be bigger here. So this one, right? Yes. So you built this entire house for three hundred sixty-five thousand dollars. And I think you have the four photos as this well. Is, oh yeah. Wow. Oh. So this is a dollar thirty. I think it was a dollar a dollar thirty. Really? Does the yeah. owner know that? Probably not. <laughs> wow. Okay. Very nice remodel. So you pick everything yourself, including the wine bar. Great. How much is this wine bar like that? So the wine bar was like $500 for the interior, and then this, the oh. bar doors are maybe $1,000 each. <laughs> really? So reclaimed wood is a really good way to make things look wonderful, yeah. and reclaimed wood is just old wood that's painted. So you have, uh, and then I found the, the wine racks on a wholesale discount online. Mm -hmm. I think they were $20. A wine rack. So this whole thing cost right. five hundred dollars. The interior and then the doors, the glass doors, the barn doors yeah. were a little bit more expensive. But wow. total maybe fifteen hundred dollars. Nice. Great. So your contractor bids are they labor only? Is that what you're saying? No. So they bid for everything, um, because generally, if you have a contractor that bids only for labor, the IRS typically deems him as your employee. So you there's a fine line between what you bring and what you don't bring. So I always have them bid based on their subs, based on their trades, and they bring in the entire budget. And then I say, okay, we are over budget. What did you put into your scope of work? Where are you getting your granite from? Where are you getting your flooring from? Hey, I have subs over here that I get all of that for a fraction of what you're paying. So let's work together there. Do, do they know that going into the, the deal? What, so they give you the proposal, right? With right. The with their number. Right. Uh, and that's from their perspective with all their subs, their numbers, their suppliers. Right. Uh, do they know that you're going to, if, if the deal runs astray and it's over budget, do they know that you're going to come in and, and say, suggest some other subs that are much cheaper? So I always suggest the subs right at the beginning. Absolutely. So okay. we never negotiate halfway through because then you end up with different colors or different palettes or different, you know, suppliers are trying to manage all of that. I do that right up front. So I negotiate everything up front, price point for everything, uh, right. I'm sorry, one more question, Sheila? Of course. Love asking you questions. So, um, now I forgot what it was. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'll come back. Sure. So I have a question. So as you scale your business and you need to get more dedicated, I suppose, contractors, Will this current strategy still work? Because I feel like if I was a contractor and then I put in a, a bid of, I think I'm gonna get $300,000, because for me, as I have a back-end deal with these suppliers, and then you're cutting it in and out of all these different things that I'm getting a cut out of, like, do you feel like that's a reason as well why they feel bad or you're not getting as much repeat contracting work? I don't necessarily feel that that's a factor because you want to weed out those contractors yeah. because as an investor you're not, I'm not here to pay top dollar for everything and have my profit go out the door so it weeds out my contractor selection because if you're not willing to work with me to lower the price 
then we're not going to work together. Because I'm not going to feed you for one project, but I'm going to continue feeding you for many years to come. And that's how you want to present, um, you know, and how you want to work with contractors. Is you're not going to make a million dollars on one home with me, because I'm not the retail buyer, and you're not going to, you know, put in the most expensive finishes, and you're not going to be 300 <coughs> grand over this person. But over four years, I can make you X amount of dollars if you use these guys and we can continue working together. So you want to try and position that differently in that sense. And so the contractors aren't willing to be flexible with their, their materials and I'm not willing to, to work with them. I remember my question now. <laughs> so what do you recommend uh, the techniques that you share with us, which are brilliant, I think, uh, with respect to the contractors and the costs? For someone like a Joe Schmo like me who doesn't, who, I can't tell color palettes from this and that, what do you recommend and how we would address that, you know, not knowing that there are alternative pricings and alternative colors and alternative solutions to, you know, what a contractor presents? So if you don't have that knowledge, you always want to ensure that you're pricing that in to your purchase price. So you want to make sure that you're purchasing even lower than what I can get things for because I do have that knowledge. So you always want to make sure you're buying to cover what you know today as opposed to what you might not know tomorrow. And then you want to, like Tom had suggested, you bring in uh, stagers, you bring in other people who can help you <coughs> otherwise. And there's lots of contractors as well that have a good eye for things they know and then you sort of you talk through that with them and you're able to do that in that sense. But if you have no knowledge, and what I recommend to everybody always is go shopping, go to Home Depot, look at prices, go look at stuff on your time off, go you know, to open homes, open houses throughout, and just start looking at materials and familiarizing yourself. But because I've had you know, 18 years in this industry, I remember grout colors and their numbers. So I just know from experience and the only way you get experience is through doing and looking. What, what's a typical contractor pad? Is it uh, padding? Is it 10% higher than that? Um, I experienced contractors with 30, 40% padding. Wow. So it really depends on the contractor, unfortunately. But for the contractors that I work with, 10% is typically what they are making. All right. do, you have, do you work with a Tommy? You know, are you, you know, kind of drafting all your contracts for contractors, you know, or real estate or contract? Do you have, in, you know, or work with any Tommy for that? Uh, sorry, work with attorneys. Oh, for Lawyers. for the contracts. Mm -hmm. So I originally, and I'm sure many of you have heard of Fortune Builders. Mm -hmm. So I started with fortune builders, and that's how I started uh, networking and into real estate. And they basically have all the documents possible. And then I also worked with an attorney at the very beginning to execute all of my documents tailored to myself. So JV's, um, you know, um, contractor documents as well. There's some verbiage in there. Um, in private investors, any sort of document I have, I did go through with an attorney originally to, to draft those, for sure. Just to kind of piggyback on that, um, how would you say that you put together your asset protection for this business that you're doing flipping houses? So, so to what extent have you put that together or put focus in that area? So I work under an escort. So I removed from my personal, um, and I'm based in California. I did have a company based out of Nevada. I didn't find that that was any more beneficial to me um, based on what I'm doing. And then I think a big part of it is making sure that you're ethical with whom you're working with and not putting yourself in that position where you might be privy to a lawsuit or whatever not. But the S Corp and being in a different company um, and removing yourself and your personal assets from your business is always a good thing. And that's all I can speak to about that. What about um, insurance? What type of insurance are you getting on your property? Vacant insurance or construction insurance? So that will depend on the project. Yeah. So if I have a duplex, it'll mm -hmm. be, um, you know, 
if tenants are in, you have tenant inspection, and then if it's vacant, you have vacancy. So it depends on the project, what yeah. sort of insurance. And generally, I will call my three insurance guys and say, here's what I have, mm -hmm. this is what's going on, give me a price. Okay, so it just depends. Right. All right. What's, what's the most expensive insurance? Because construction is more expensive, right, since it's more risky. Um, let's say on this project, how much did it cost to carry that insurance for nine months? Um, oh boy, that was a while ago. I don't like recall. 3000 4000 5000 Insurance definitely has gone up now, yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. I think on the fourplex, we just are doing, I think that's 21, 22. 2200. 2, so not too bad. A year. I'm sorry? Is that a year? Annually, right. So that's and so I also work with agents, uh, insurance agents, who will give you, if you uh, close sooner, they'll give you the difference back mm -hmm. as well. So they take a premium up front and then whatever difference when you sell. Yeah, I also just say from a, a liability perspective, whenever we do payments to contractors, we always get them to sign release liens. Yeah, release liens. Okay, good cool. point. Can you explain that? So basically so they can't sue you for mispayments on the work that they've done. So you're saying this is what I'm getting paid, I'm, I'm accountable. But they won't come after you for that. So essentially at every payment with a contractor, you want to have them sign a lien waiver. And so it will stipulate how much you've paid them. They can't put a lien on your project thus far. Very often, you, they can put a mechanics lien on it if there's a dispute or you haven't paid them or whatever, which will affect when you need to sell. So in that respect, you always want to have lien waivers at every juncture where you're making a payment. So then you're covered as well. Conditional, conditional lien, wa lien waiver during the job, unconditional and final payment. Thank you. Right now, are you currently looking at any deals, or is there any deals recently that you didn't want to buy because the numbers were slim, um, or what's, what's the recent one that you can share with us so we don't buy it? From you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure to send you those. Um, do you remember any off the top of your head? Um, there's one across from Kingswood. Really? From where? From uh, which one? Five. The one John. Oh, yes. right. So we did purchase a duplex uh, from my mentor, John, and then he had the other one across the street. Yeah. Um, and that was just a higher price. Oh, really? And that's when we just said no. Oh, it was, it was too high. Right. Okay. So it was selling more because he purchased for yeah. a higher price. And it was you know, not, not within my comfort yeah. zone at the end of ARV. Can we check it out real quick? Do you mind? Yeah, um, 590 Lynxwood. 590 Lynxwood? Right. L Y N L Y N K X. 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 Apparently okay. can't spell. Links wood. X. X, sorry. X. Wood. There so we go. this is a duplex that we purchased. In Santa Cruz? In Sunnyvale. 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 Wow. It's like a half mile from Apple. Half mile from Apple. Mm -hmm. So this was on the MOS, correct? Um, so it was listed on MLS for a duration, yeah. and then the agent had, it came actually in a parcel. So John had purchased like 12, excuse me, 12 properties, Yeah. Uh, and he sold me this one. Oh. Right. So he sold it for 1.55, right? Since uh, he purchased for 1.55. Oh, he purchased. And then he uh, sold it for slightly higher with Maybe his Maybe 1.6. 1.6. Right. Okay. And then, in order to do this one, you would want to make, let's say, a couple hundred grand. So you would want to sell it for 1.9. Is that correct? 1. So 9. my ARV on this one is 2.1. 2 .1. 2.1, right. and you still didn't want it. Sorry. Really? What was your? Oh price? no. So yeah. this this was the one we purchased. The yeah. one across the street was yeah. selling for 150 one more. Oh. Oh really? Right. 150 okay. more. Yeah. So I think so. So okay. let's say 1.7. 1. 7. Two five. Okay, let's go <coughs> over this deal real quick. Seven five. I can't remember. One point seven. Let's say one point seven, and the ARV was um, uh, two point one. Right. Two point one. That's a four hundred thousand dollars spread. 
but you said it's too high, right? Because you want to make, you want better deals or... Right. So again, just because I don't do volume at this point, I'll yeah. cherry pick I see. the best ones. Wow. So you want over half a million at least on your deal. <laughs> well, you have to factor in construction budgets yeah. if you have it. So how much, how much is repairs? <laughs> Let's say duplex, great. right? Duplex, yes. so two units. Right. So maybe fifty to seventy-five thousand each unit, roughly. Roughly, yeah. Yeah, with your yeah. with your materials for a dollar thirty. Right. I'm not gonna tell you. What <laughs> so my um, construction here is about a hundred. Yeah, hundred. So not too bad. So hundred k. So now total cost is one point eight, and ARV is two point one. So that's still gross is 300K. And closing cost is what's gonna kill you, right? Since it's such a high price. So closing cost could be five to 10%. Um, listing agent commission, they're gonna want at least one to two and a half. Yeah, buyer agent, two and a half. You can't negotiate that. Escrow. And this is not including hard money yet. So let's just say 10% of two million is 200K. So we can kind of see why you didn't really like this one, right? Because mm -hmm. net profit is now only 100K. So it's still not enough for you. You're expensive. <laughs> well, you only want to make half a million. Old, I like nice purses, <laughs> nice shoes, right? So was right? this four, three, four, five months? Three, four, five months. Right. Three? So two months for construction, two. four months total. Okay. So, so I, I want to say it's like, it, it's kind of, people in real estate sometimes get greedy. For when sure. you look at when you look at a hundred thousand dollars in four months, how many employees really make a hundred thousand in four months? Well, you're absolutely right. I, I mean, this is ridiculous. I always look at this and go, "Oh my god!" In real estate, it's just you know, just right. just getting started in in June this year. I look at this and you know, you start looking at a hundred thousand, two hundred twenty-five thousand in forty-eight hours and stuff like this, and it's like, "Oh my freaking god!" In real estate, you can actually think this way. When you actually have a job, you don't think that way. You go, well, I make 150000 a year, and you have to work 12-hour days, right? Right, but as an employee, do you possibly lose 100 in a day because the market went down? Correct. That's so, the risk. Right. So there is a far more risk as an investor at this price point because as, if you've done a flip, very, I have yet to hit my budget 100%. You're always over with contingencies or you may not hit the market price that you want. So Yeah, that's why you're conservative. Right, exactly. So 2.1, if the market drops or it's Christmas or you know whatever happens at that time, I might only get two. And now my 100, 100 is, is gone. Or I might go over construction by 15%. Your profit goes down again. And then winds are blowing, you don't hit your ARV, your construction goes over, and now you're in the red. So that's why I'm conservative, because I'm not in this to lose money. I'm in this for longevity and to make money. But as an employee, you don't go to work and <coughs> your boss is not going to say, hey, hey, I didn't have a good day. Can you give me a hundred grand today? So there's that risk and liability that you take with an investor as opposed to an employee. So that sort of sets and on us this, apart. And on this one, a wholesale actually would have been a better strategy. Only wholesale probably made 20 grand, 25 grand. You made 100, the right. idea was no risk, holding cost, no construction, a lot less time. Right. So in, in this, a wholesale would have been a better- A better deal for A better them. deal, for sure. knowing that there's a fix and flip strategy, a wholesale strategy, and- Right. And you always wanna have multiple exit strategies in every property, regardless. Sorry, what kind of cushion do you like to have in your- So, six figures. Six factors okay. comfortably. Yeah. So I won't do like 100 on the nose, you know, 150, 200. So I do have a buffer because I do often go over contingencies and spend contingencies. I get to hit my exact budget even with all my experience. You open up a wall, there's mold. You open up, you know, kitchen sinks that have been leaking or the roof all of a sudden is leaking because it rains heavily here. So there's a lot of unexpected things when you start opening cabinets or plumbing or electrical that you have to account for that you may not have it, that me as not a licensed electrician or a licensed plumber that I may not just know looking at a photo. So I always like to make sure that my numbers have buffers for sure.
So, so I got a question. Now, based on that, what is your contingency? On the 14 projects, I'm pretty sure you're going back right now, you're seeing a game yeah. right now. What is the contingency? As a fortune builder to fortune builder right now, I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. Is there something, you have a rule of thumb out there that you can share with everybody on the budgets that you've seen? So 10%, I think, is, is pretty good. Um, I've got, had contingencies that went like 50% because so many unexpected things have come up. That um, you spent 50% more than the right, budget? Right, right. So there's lots of things that come up uh, that I didn't account for, uh, you know, to totally rewire an entire home or to the, all the plumbing is shot. It's, you know, and then maybe you get in with a buyer and now they're not happy because you didn't change the copper and the plumbing. So then there's contingencies in that respect where now you want to work with the buyer, but they're not happy because they're living in it, they're, you know, whatever. So there's that negotiating budget, not only in the construction side, but on the selling side as well. How do you evaluate the ARV on the multi-family house? So uh, that is based on ROI. So you based on how much rent you can get, um, how much percentage in different areas. So in San Jose, a 5% cap rate is a really good cap rate for um, new buyers. Uh, new landlords, and then for better properties, uh, better areas like Sunnyvale, you could get away with maybe a 3% cap rate. So you base it on what you think market value rents are for however many units you have, then you do the math in that sense, how much expenses are, and that's how you get your ARB. How do you determine the cap rate in different areas? Like so that is something that you just have to look up online, because I'm not even, I'm slowly entering into, thank you, into multifamilies myself, so I'm not 100% familiar with all cap rates, but there's lots of resources online. You can also, um, you know, look at market rent value and base it on that as well. Maybe I missed this. You talked about um, your financing for the purchase. What about for your construction costs? Is that, are you doing that up front or are you paying out of pocket? Where's that money coming from? So I typically have private lenders that will fund the gap for my own funds. And so uh, the hard money lender will come in in the purchase. Uh, my lender does 80%. And sometimes they'll actually even do construction for me if I need it. But I have investors and private investors that I built rapport with that fund the gap for me. We're always looking for money. <laughs> that too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Oops. I think that concludes our presentation. Yeah, okay, time to go home. Well, I, I kind of like the dark. Very intimate. I like it. What are some factors that uh, contribute to your flip success? I'll find the OB, OB uh, doctor. OB? <laughs> Who's the doctor in here? Okay, so what would you rec recommend for someone new that wants to start flipping and um, what has helped you? You've been so successful, you never lost money in one deal. That's pretty good. Not even one deal. So I think the biggest factor with succeeding is having a mentor. Uh, having somebody who, if you come into any obstacles, and even at my experience level, I still have a mentor. He, you know, and he and I exchange things. When he comes across things, he'll call me as well at this point. But always having somebody that you can talk to that you can talk through your deal, you can overcome all the obstacles, that they can help you think outside the box. It's the biggest one. Did you meet your mentor through Fortune Builders? Um, I, he is a Fortune Builder member, but we did not meet through Fortune Builders. So we actually had an agent, a uh, mutual friend. Um, so the, the long of it is that this agent, I actually knew from back home. He had moved to Silicon Valley doing something else. He had met John, they were talking, and then I was talking to Dennis. He said, hey, I think you guys are doing the same thing. He introduced us, and that's how I met my mentor. So just a lot of networking, and I apparently am really good at talking. So hopefully no one's fallen asleep yet. <laughs> or negotiating with a contract. <laughs> I'm impressed with that. That's pretty amazing. I can't believe you built that house for 360. Up. It was a it was a good project, a good contractor. How much capital capital do you have personally on reserve 
for these projects? Like how much would you put just in case? So it really depends on the project and then it depends on the investors as well that I have in my pool. So anywhere from you know 100 to a couple hundred. Um, but I like to keep my investors happy and keep on having them invest. So I will put them in before I put myself in because I'm still making the back end money. But I want that I don't want to lose their focus because if I lose their focus, they're investing in Apple or you know somebody else and then I'm stuck without the gap funding. So I'll always stick them in before I stick my own money in. So um, what's your preference? Because you did a ground up, a scrape and a rebuild, and the rehab, and you said about the perils of opening up a wall and whatever. If you, you know, if you could choose your model going forward, what would be the cleanest for you? The cleanest definitely for me would be ground up construction or new construction just because then I have control of everything. I know exactly what's going in. There's no surprises. It's what I'm familiar with, what I'm comfortable with. Um, that would be my ideal, but I'm not at that point in my business where I want to focus solely on that currently. So some some point I definitely want to get there. So you do like ground construction even more than regular flipping. Right. Yeah, because more profitable, more control, more right. more benefits right. overall. And then more design, because I do yeah. like the design aspect. From scratch. Right. Okay, nice. So you like to build maybe five, ten houses at one time in the future? <laughs> right. Who was that that had a lot? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 22 acres. Right. Uh, that might be a little bit too big. <laughs> no. Okay, so we talked a little bit about this before, how you... Um, found your own materials and you use on sale materials that looks nice um, would you mind sharing your vendors um yeah so one of my vendors is unimarble unimarble for granite and okay. I, I never remember the tile company right next door but they're right next door and i use them uh, next door and you have an account with them so um, what do you say bill it to sheila wong <laughs> cabinet? Cabinet? Um, cabinet is K. K -Z, J, J and K. J and K. J and K. And I think they are... Newark. Is that Newark? Yeah, Newark. Newark. The windows? Windows? Newark? Um, you just windows, said I don't have a supplier uh, for windows. What's that? I don't have a supplier for windows. So usually my contractor, whoever, does retrofit windows. Do you like to use a specific time, mill guard? Or right. Over? Okay. Yeah. The so. tile place is called Hira. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Hira? -E. That's right. H E R A. I think that's the sushi guy. Oh. Hira? That's the sushi guy. That is for Hira. Plumber, electrician? Hero. <laughs> 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 Who's a plumber, electrician, a mechanical guy? Any when you can think about, or those come through your? your yeah, GC? those will come through my contractors as well, because okay. they tend to like their own subs in those areas. Plumbing resource, um, online. Online, yeah. anywhere. Um, I usually tend, depending on what sort of um, what size of rehab, I will use any. So in the higher end, I obviously do Groey and Hans Frey, and then the lower end ones, I'll do Delta and Moen. Just Home Depot. Um, are you going to send this out to your everybody? It depends how much uh, you give me. <laughs> <laughs> $20, $30, whoever pays the highest. I might just stay on Facebook. Yeah, you can send it to me. Is there a sign-in sheet or is there... Oh yeah, there's a sign -in sheet, so please write down your email, otherwise we can't uh, spam you. So Put it on Facebook. <laughs> write down your email, your number, and your address. Just kidding. Just email number. It's good. Okay, so we went over this. We recommend getting a mentor. Is anyone willing to mentor here? Terry, there's a lot of flips. You want to mentor all 40 of us too? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> you can ask Terry who else has done multiple flips so far that doesn't mind sharing their experience. Can you raise your hand for those that want to find a mentor? Anybody? Nobody wants to mentor? I will okay. in a year. How about that? <laughs> okay, Tara's a contractor too, so he'll partner up with you on deals if you have deals and you need construction, um, people like that. 
Yep. Yeah. So let's see. So right now, what type of marketing do you like to do? Do you just talk to agents and wholesalers or? Right. So strictly agents, wholesalers, and other investors. Wow. So no mailers, nothing? None. Wow. Yeah. So you save a lot of money because there's some right. people like doing five, ten, twenty thousand a month in mailers. Right. And I don't those... even make that much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. so I think um, very often I'll run into wholesalers. Yeah. That, that is what they do and all they do. Yeah. They do mailers. So, let them... so then I so I let them do the mailers. Yeah. And then I get the them. <coughs> Okay, very nice, very nice. So save a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, Sheila, when you work with agents, do you also, if they bring you pocket listings of market, do you also have them list the properties for you? Absolutely. Or give them an opportunity to do that? Right, absolutely. So when you bring me an off market, I always give it back to them. I'm very loyal to my agents because I want them to bring me more business. And that's also how you build credibility with all your agents. You want to keep you want you want to be the first person on speed dial when they have an off-market property. So you want to make sure again in that mentality of a win-win, they're getting a double end, and then possibly a triple end if they bring a buyer. So worst, I, and I've worked with many agents that aren't great agents, but you still want to work with them and still have integrity in your own business as well. Go back to your private money pools. I was wondering how do you. Organize it. Do you get the money first and have in a separate account, or do you fundraise after you get a deal? Right. So I typically will fundraise before the deal because I don't like being stressed about finding money. Very often, there's investors who will find money, you know, dialing for numbers or for dollars. They get the deal, and then they're they're frantically calling everybody they know. I don't like to work in that capacity. So I have my pool of investors, and very often they will just have their funds sitting in a separate bank account with me, and they are happy to just keep rolling things in, and then I pull them whenever I need. And you're paying them 12% once it's in your account? Right, right. Um, Do you sign anything in advance? Let's say a line of credit or anything, just to make sure that they're interested, or you just kind of trust them? My private your private money letters, yeah. Do you sign anything? In so I do too? have contracts with yeah. them, um, yeah. and they are leaned on the property. Yeah. So I make sure that everyone's leaned properly, um, and they're you know in case I get hit by a bus, that yeah. they can still claim their money back. <coughs> so there is contracts always in place to protect yourself as yeah. well as them, um, and then their money doesn't come into play, and interest doesn't come into play until I actually use the funds. It's, it's an account. Right. Or oh, until you use the funds or until it hits your it account? It hits my account. Oh, right. gotcha, gotcha. Right. Okay. right, is typically when I would use it. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. All right. As a private money lender, I like the fact that your projects are an average of four months. Because having my money tied up for 10, 12 months, you know, kind of limits my ability to, you know, keep rolling, as you say, into other projects and get for that. Sure. 12% APR, right? Right, right. Because, absolutely. You know, if it's tied up at month six and I've missed your project at month four, so that's a very good model. I like it. Thank you. Well, we can definitely talk about investing with us. Sign me up. Let me be on your list. Okay, we're uh, going to conclude soon. If you have any more questions, uh, thank you, Sheila. This is very good information. Thank you. learned a lot today and we're all going to learn how to build houses with Sheila from ground up. That will be the next five. Right? For only $150 <laughs> per square feet. Yes. Right? Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So thank you guys for coming um, and spending your Tuesday night with us. And I think that's it. I don't know what else can to I, say. Can I promote? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. All right, I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, is this internet? <clears throat> internet? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go minimize. Right there. So Rick also has another meetup group that he hosts on a weekly basis. So you can actually keep on learning and learning and learning. Uh, who's been to my meetup group before? Raise your hand. Uh, Terriel, how was uh, uh, Velocity Banking? Um, I heard something I've never heard anybody use before, and I'm a financial geek. So you've been in the industry for a while. Uh, 17 years in uh, hands-on flipping, building, and uh, financing before that for 10. So um, it's, it's definitely something that, you see, uh, it's, it's an interesting thing that we, find, we meet people here 
and all of us come up with some ingenious ideas. It doesn't mean each one of us is going to come up with that. Yeah. Whatever Rick was talking about, I had, seriously, my jaw was gone. Because it's so simple, but at the same time, it's so applicable to each one of us. And just, you know, all of us pay percentage, all of us pay interest rate now. And the way for us to become wealthy, not rich, is to keep the most that we can and to make most of what we can. So what he had to share, just one event, I mean, I would, hands down, I'll go there again. And for sure, it's a, something that invaluable. Rock is dot com. Oh, dot com? Yeah. yeah. Just one more thing also. Oh, meetup dot com. <laughs> Thank mind, you so like, much. <laughs> Rick, uh, one more thing, just uh, to keep, keep in mind that, again, when you're talking about, you know, making percentage, on what you have, you know, on your money, on your savings, he's going to be able to show you the way how to increase that savings, so you can have that, you know, million dollars in your equity much faster than anybody else. So that's um, kind of a cool thing. Yeah, very cool. Th th thank you um, so much. Actually, when I heard about the velocity banking strategy, um, it actually blew my mind. Um, because let me ask you, how many people own a house? Okay. Um, Name out, name your uh, some of your uh, percentages that you're getting from your. Um, what's your interest? Four. Four. Anybody else? Three point five. Three point five. Um, let me give you a simple uh, analogy on how you how much you're going to pay for that property. Um, so it's a three point five multiplied by two, and add a zero. So what's that come out to? Seventy. Seventy percent. So if you bought a house for uh, how much? This was say three hundred million dollars. Million dollars. Okay. So if you go to your amortization loan, you know how much that money that that property is going to cost you? One point seven million dollars. So the, 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 what happens is is that really a three point five percent loan? If you look at it like, let's look at numbers. Is that really three point five percent? $700,000 loan. The, the answer is no, <laughs> right? So who, you, who are we working for? The, who are we working for? Normally. If you, so that what happens is in a 30 year period where you have, if you kept it for the entire amount of time, the, what, what most people think about is their monthly payment, right? What's my monthly payment? What's my monthly payment? But what happens is what if I could actually show you how to pay that off in eight years, not 30? doing nothing different, would that interest you? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And what happens is, did you, were you blown away that you could pay off a house in eight years, not 30? Well, pretty much I hit right now everybody that I know to increase my credit line, I'm kind of running in the front right now, but. <laughs> once you, once, yeah, thing. once you restructure what your cash flow is, your cash flow sometimes can go from 200 to 2,000 a month. What's more important? Trying to live off 200 a month or having a cash flow of 2,000 a month? No, no question. So a lot of times people don't really realize what, um, what, who they're really working for. So the Federal Reserve is kind of in bed with the banking system because when you pay for a loan, what's the first thing, what's the bank, how do the banks make most of their money? They call them upfront fees. So most of the time what you're spending for, uh, for the first seven, 10 years, 18. 18 years goes to the bank. So they call them upfront fees. So you're paying 80% upfront fees when you should be really working for yourself, not for the banks, correct? You might work in that first year, you'd be working 10 months for the bank, but only two months for yourself. But you bought a house for what reason? To get well, maybe for my wife, but anyway. <laughs> but most of the time, if you're doing an investment, what are we doing it for? Long time retirement and long time uh, to not save one day, not uh, save one day for, you know, to retire. It's, if you could retire in five years, wouldn't you want to do that? If, yeah. yes, absolutely yes. So if you had, in the same 30 years, if you could pick up 10 homes versus one home, what's the difference? So the idea was, that's what we teach, velocity banking. That's what happened was, um, so basically, just write down that website. Uh, when you come, hold on right here, let me see. Go to here, www.bear area. Uh, it's, it's called Bay Area Real Estate Weekly Mastermind Group. Um, 
and or go to the meetup, link on it, say that you're part of this group, um, because uh, on where you referred to this, just go, you were referred to this because of the fix and flip group, okay? When you get there, you'll know why. Because, anyway, I'll, I'll tell you the reason why, but I won't, I won't get into it. So here, um, we started, uh, we've got three rooms. We got a, uh, a training room there. We have a, which, there's my story. It's my uh, ex-Marine, two girls, my motorhome. It's a house I built in Willow Glen right there. Uh, this is a CVS I built in San Francisco, right across from Pier 39. This is a house in Saratoga I built. This is my mentor, my brother, um, who introduced me to real estate uh, four, five months ago. And uh, so five months ago, we had a little group meeting right here. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew to where now we have over 50 to 60, 70 people a week, probably over probably 100 this week uh, because we're growing so fast. Uh, you'll understand why, because if, if we gave you some money, would that help you grow my group? If I gave you cash, would that help you grow my group? Yeah. Guess what? Three people to 70 and people got paid growing my group. You'll understand that how, when I, you're not here. I'm not here to promote it tonight. What I'm here to say is, uh, we meet every single week. I would not have done my first deal without, um, without Tom. I found the deal Wednesday, I brought it to the team Thursday, sold it Friday. And what happened was, Curly, uh, that was one wholesale deal, uh, there's another wholesale deal, um, and um, $65,000 in the last 90 days. And the reason why that was it was because I was up against the fence. When I got started in real estate, I needed $23,000. I had no money, no time. Who works 12 hours a day? I do. <laughs> 12 hours a day, I had no contacts. And the number one thing is when you sit in the back of a corner like this and you need the money, and my wife goes, um, well, where are you gonna get it? The attorney wants their eight grand, the mother-in-law wants her 12 grand, the uh, other friend wants his four grand. I got into real estate with no money, no time, no energy, and just the pure fact is I had to make money overnight. So I started a little group. I started on three people, it went to six, went to nine, and it went to now over 70, almost 100 a week. We'll be at 250 next year. The end of next year, my goal is 250 a week. When you talk about, um, when you talk about mentorship and um, what does it take to do real estate, what does it take? Mentorship, community, and weekly support. Would you agree? Great. Without that, without that, there is no deal. So how many people have never done a deal before? Have never done a wholesale deal? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Now we got room for five. <laughs> okay. I'm doing and I'm doing a starting tomorrow. Um, it's outside of this group. I'm starting tomorrow as a wholesale wholesale um, class. What that is, is that's a 90 day challenge that you do your first deal. Is that the three week class? Yes. Oh, I'm signed up. Somebody else can have my spot. Yeah, you can have a spot. Yes, that's one left. Okay, great. Um, the reason why is I want you to do your first deal. Because if I help you get your first deal, would, would you be a part of a mastermind group for the next 10 years? I'm not gonna be, Tom's never gonna get rid of me. <laughs> Tom's never gonna, right. Tom's, never, Tom, Tom's never gonna get rid of me. That's how um, we close our biggest deal, because the community yeah, and because the support the, that we get. Because the community and the support and um, deals. So we have people, full-time wholesalers, full-time fix and flippers, full-time people doing um, tax notes, gain, or tax liens, uh, multifamily. We have everything there. And the reason why we actually do it on a weekly basis is because I want to add value to change your life. I really, truly want, just like my life, I don't, I'm debt free on my credit card bills right now. Every, my car notes will be done, paid off by the end of this year. I am fully 100% debt free by the end of the year. And guess what? I was on the back of the corner in June and I started real estate. So I don't care where you're at. I don't care where you're at in your life. If you want to make money, just, 
come to my meetup group and over and over and over we'll help you do your first deal. We'll help you if you got money. Um, if you got money, <laughs> well, let's, let's partner and let's, let's help you make money in real estate, um, hard money lending, um, wholesaling, fix and flip, learning how to buy and hold, learning how to pay off properties, and learning how to actually change your life into a tax deduction. So anyway, without that said, I'm just, I'm so excited. What time is it? So um, Wednesday. So the, the Wednesday, okay, so that? hold on, I'm just going to, if you want to go to the wholesale class, um, I have a sign-up sheet. Uh, I have a sign-up sheet. So if you want to do the wholesale class, it is full. <laughs> You're first. Here you go. Um, the wholesale class. And then anybody else, um, uh, anybody else that wants to come on Meetup, hit hit the Meetup group. Or if you just go to the website, um, you can register. Just make sure you put Fix and Flip, um, Fix and Flip group. Um, you could end up ultimately being, Tom could end up being your mentor for the rest of your life. But yeah, how many people would on Tom as their mentor for the rest of their life? So, <laughs> so the answer is, is, is yes. Uh, Tom's my mentor for my, the rest of my life, so he understands it. So like I said, you'll know a lot more about our community, how we pay you to build my meetup group, how we actually, um, number one, help you do your deals. We have mentorship, we have a community, and we actually pay you, so it's, um, it's nice. So anyway, with that said, uh, the wholesale class there, I crossed my fingers, we have enough room. <laughs> but if we don't, we'll, we'll make it work. We'll make it work, so. And then, this meetup group's on Thursday. The wholesaling class is only for three weeks starting tomorrow. It is free. I am giving my heart, my soul, my things because it changed my life. And I want it to change your life. I want you to dear deal. I did education for three years. Three years and I never did a deal. Anybody relate? I did it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And I'm going to tell you why you didn't, you haven't done your first deal. I'm going to tell, oh, excuse me, let me rephrase. I'm going to tell you why I didn't do my first deal, which you probably will relate to. Um, and I want you to do your first deal over and over and over. So that's why I started the wholesale glass class. Bernard? Yes. How, many, how much money did you make in wholesale in the last six months? Uh, 220? 220. Yes. Bernard's going to be there. I am? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am willing to help. Yes. Yes. We'll, we'll teach so, you how to find deals, buy deals, contract. Find deals, contract. I can talk all night. You guys, you guys want to go home. I literally will. If you want me to put up in the run room, if you guys want to stay, I'll blow your mind. It's so exciting. But with that said, I don't want to take, I don't want to take away from you. But Thank you. Thank yeah, feel free to go. It's, it's in Santa Clara at night, just like this. So it's free. Up to you guys. And feel free to hang out. We're gonna hang out for a little bit after. And yeah, thank you guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.